Welcome everyone. My name is Susan Patterson. I'm the host of this YouTube channel, Winning the Fight Against Human Trafficking and Child Exploitation. This channel is made up of the contributions of many people who have made a significant contribution to the end of human trafficking, like Tara Hilliard from Forgotten Children. In this video, Tara shares from her experience in working with victims of sex trafficking in such a way that one can gain insight into best approaches for anyone who could come in contact with someone who could be a victim of sex trafficking. Forgotten Children does trainings for churches and Tara will share the kinds of things that are covered in the training. Understanding the mindset of a sex trafficking victim will go a long way to change the narrative from people seeing prostituted people as choosing the life they are in to truly understanding that they are trapped. If you feel called to serve victims and survivors of sex trafficking, I recommend you watch this video, The Role of the Church in Supporting Survivors of Human Trafficking, as it covers many different programs a church could set up to address the needs of victims. Please do support our work by subscribing to this channel and liking and sharing this video. Let's join Tara now. Welcome everyone. I am so happy to have Tara with us today, who's the director of Forgotten Children, which is a nonprofit that serves victims of sex trafficking. Thank you, Susan, for having me. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Tara Hilliard, and I am the president and CEO of Forgotten Children, Inc., or FCI, um, which we um, go by um, predominantly because there's so many forgotten children's um, and organizations, and so we're FCI, but um, I am, I've been at the helm now going on in my sixth, sixth year, and I'm super excited. Um, our organization was founded by Pastor Paula Daniels, who had a heart and a passion for young women. Um, she was first um, introduced to human trafficking on a missions trip to South Africa and had no idea that the issue of human trafficking was um, alive and well here in the United States. And so when she got back, she, had, she was planning to pack up and move to South Africa to help the young women she had met in this small village. And um, the Lord pretty much showed her that right on Long Beach Boulevard in the city of Linwood, um, there were human trafficking victims. And so unfortunately here in the US, human trafficking looks different than it does overseas. And so, you know, we've seen young girls on the streets as prostitutes every day in front of schools, in front of motels. And we just kind of wagged our fingers at those girls and said, you know, she should know better, not understanding that behind yeah. the girl on the corner is a pimp slash trafficker that's really calling the shots and, and, and coercing and forcing her into a life of prostitution. And yes. so, yeah, so now we're, we're, we, we're 15 years old and um, we have grown from Pastor Paula's table and two chairs and donuts and coffee to a full service organization providing wraparound um, services and aftercare support to victims of human trafficking. That's fantastic. So uh, the theme of our um, conversation today is how we need to change the narrative if we're gonna really address human trafficking, specifically with regard to preventing it. So um, what would you like to tell our audience about that? Well, I think first, before we can talk about prevention, we have to talk about education and awareness. And, you know, we live in a day and age where everything is at your fingertips via the internet, via, you know, um, if you think of it, you can talk in into your phone and next thing you know, within seconds, you can have any topic brought to the forefront. But not many people are talking about human trafficking and the impact that it's having in our communities, especially communities of color, especially among young African-American girls. We're talking about everything else, um, including, you know, one of the things that, you know, I'm kind of, you know, um, upset about is how in our community, um, especially within the Black community, that it's been um, kind of, it's just par for the course for a young girl to meet an older guy and, and, and we've held her responsible, we've never held him accountable. And so we, we don't hold adults responsible for um, the abuse that they inflict on children. We don't hold men responsible for watching pornography and going to strip clubs. And we do not hold the system accountable for the impact and devastation that is done to families as well as the devastation and impact it's had on children, especially within the foster care system. Yeah, that's such a good point. Go ahead. Yeah, and so, so there's so many layers 
that would have to be addressed in order to to do prevention. Um, and so, you know, our goal, you know, we've decided to take, you know, little chips and pieces um, of the issue. Um, so for example, we provide awareness education to churches, to um, community-based organizations. We partner with law enforcement. And so we look for various ways um, that we can raise awareness to dispel myths, to, to, to bring it to the forefront. In fact, just today I did a full Zoom with moms that reside in Pacific Palisades talking wow. about the issue of human trafficking. And that's leading to a conversation they want us to have with their boys um, because they, one mom said, you know, I really want our boys to become educated so they don't become perpetrators yeah. of human trafficking without even knowing that they're doing it. And I thought that was so on time for her to say that. And, and so I think that's what it is. We, we, we educate girls, um, to be nice little girls, keep your legs closed. But when it comes to boys, boys will be boys, men will be men, right? And so I think in order, I know we're talking about changing the narrative, part of changing that narrative is really taking a look at the picture holistically and then piece by piece, you know, um, creating uh, programs and, um, and information that can address every layer of human trafficking and yeah. how it starts. Yes, and I think where we really need to intervene, particularly with men, is they see the ads, and according to the ads, this woman is whatever, a nymphomaniac, she's into it, this is what she wants. They really need to, every time they see these ads, see a victim, to know that there is a pimp or human trafficker, like you said, calling the shots. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't want their mother or sister ever victimized like that, to really appeal to their heart. Yeah. And that's kind of what I said today to those moms. I said, because one mom said, well, how do I start the conversation? I said, well, one of the things that we can all agree with is that boys protect their moms and their sisters. Yes. Um, husbands protect their moms, their sisters, their grandma, all the females in their family. And I said, just pose a question. What if she was me or what if she was your sister? Right. Because what they've done is that they, human trafficking is a victimless crime. They feel like she was a willing participant. Nobody was harmed here. She got paid, you know, no big deal. Right. But we don't, they don't understand that these are victims. These are girls that um, if you look into their background, may have had a history of uh, sexual abuse as a child, come out of, you know, um, homes that were broken, no father, um, and now, you know, they've been forced into this situation. So she's a willing participant, not because she's willing, but because she has to be. And yeah. so, you know, going, I think looking beneath the surface really is what has to happen, especially in this conversation about human trafficking. Yes. So she's a willing victim because for her, she doesn't see she has any other options. Right. Exactly. Other than, you know, being, uh, letting herself be pimped out like that in terms of trying to survive or anything else. So yes. And, and I don't, do off and a I, common just, story. Go ahead. Yeah. And I'll interject here. I don't even know if she's letting herself be pimped out versus this is what, this is all she has. Yes. It, it's yes. Like that's you, better said. Yes. Yeah. When you're not, when you don't have any other options and this is your only option and you choose the only option that's right for you. And that's why service providers are so important, like Forgotten Children, because, you know, we come on the scene and we say, but you do have more options and you do have an alternative and he's not your only resource and he's not the only person who can provide you with a roof over your head or food and things like that. And so that's how you begin to change the narrative. Very good. That's outstanding. Great. Now, I know that you've done a lot of training um, in churches. Um, who do you train and what are the kinds of things you tell them with regard to how to identify victims and what do they do once they've been identified? Go ahead. Right. So we've partnered with uh, a few churches. Well, let me back up. Uh, Forgotten Children is a faith-based organization and we're under um, the umbrella of the Assemblies of God of Southern California. And, um, and that has been a great benefit for us because it also creates a platform for us to be able to speak from the perspective of being a faith-based organization. And so, you know, when we have gone to train churches, we first, um, we solicit the pastor to, in order to train the leadership. And so we start there. So we'll ex uh, train their executive leadership about just what human trafficking is. That's number one. And then after the executive leadership is trained, then we'll train the ministerial staff and or um, ushers and deacons and things like that about how to identify a victim, 
um, that may come into your church. One of the things, oddly enough, that most churches never think about is I know, um, you know, uh, it's culturally appropriate, especially within the black church to where there's a meeting and greeting, hug your neighbor kind of thing. Right. And so we have come in with training to say that may not be appropriate because you don't know if the neighbor is a is a girl that has experienced any sort of trauma and or is currently being victimized. And the reason we bring that up is because we had a girl that that she went to church um, right after coming out of the life and someone turned a man turned to her to hug her and it freaked her totally out. And so we talk about. Um, you know, within the congregation, there are certain things that maybe we should do a little bit different and a little bit better. For example, so instead of saying, turn to your neighbor and, hu and hug, hug your neighbor, why don't you turn to your neighbor and just say good Sunday morning or something like that. Um, we train um, about being sensitive. Um, when you see a certain, because you can see when she comes in, you know, the type of person or who she is. So she comes in, she, you know, she's not dressed like, you know, Sunday morning. She looks awkward. And so the, the ushers are the first line of defense in every single church. Um, and so uh, ushers need to know if a person has a certain type of body language, if she's acting a certain kind of, then she needs, she needs to be given um, a specialized attention. And that's when you take her to the ministerial staff and say, hi, we, we observed this young lady and she came through and we just want to love on her and let her know that we're here. So we, we train in that and how to be sensitive, how to acknowledge, how to, um, how to be aware. And I think that's the biggest thing is churches have to be aware of the women that come through those doors. Very good. Now, if they are clear that this person is a victim of uh, sex trafficking, um, what is your recommendations? So the churches that we have trained with um, and trained, if they identify that someone has come in as a victim, they contact us. And that has happened actually. Um, and they'll contact us and we will then um, if we can, if we can um, dispatch or deploy staff or volunteers right then and there, we'll go. If not, she's given our contact information um, with the promises that we would follow up the next day. And, and both, both scenarios have happened here. Perfect. So a church would need to partner with a nonprofit. Absolutely. Yeah. Not just any nonprofit, but a, 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 oh, yeah, that is a provider yeah. right, yes. right, of services mm -hmm. because the average person is not trained. I mean, they could, you know, inadvertently trigger them and not realize they're doing it. It's very important to bring in people who are trained to work with victims. Mm -hmm. So if um, someone, say, were to see someone on the street who they suspect is a victim of human trafficking or at a coffee shop or whatever, what do you recommend would be the best approach? Well, Number one, we and we tell our staff and volunteers, our board of directors, and they'll all if they had this conversation with you, they'll say, Tara tells us never to approach her, do not do anything. And it, you know, it makes you angry because you you have the moment and you can seize the moment and help this girl. And um, but I tell people all the time, you don't know at that moment who's watching her or or what's happening. And so we have advised if it's a situation where you're noticing her being abused or uh, she's in an immediate uh, situation where she needs help to contact either your local law enforcement or the national human trafficking hotline. Let them know that you have a girl here. She's, um, the situation looks sketchy. I don't know all the details, but she's on the corner of X, Y, and Z, or she's at this address. Send some help and go on. Um, because one, one thing, and I want to just go back a little bit, um, you know, we've observed and what uh, we have teams that go out to the streets and most of the people, if you're driving down the street, you only see the girl, you don't, you don't right. take a look at right. what's happening around. And so um, when the girls are working, there's always a scout, he's on a bicycle watching, making sure that she's working. Um, the pimps are not far off, they're either parked on the side street or in the cars. Um, uh, on certain streets like Figueroa, you have a lot of storefronts that have apartments above the, the stores. And so they'll hang out up there look, watching out of the windows. And so um, we've even had situations where we have uh, been on the streets to give out a one of our freedom bags. And she'll say, I have to keep walking because he's watching. And so we'll give her the bag and we'll keep going. And so those are the details that an untrained eye won't notice or won't see. Um, because you've not been taught to take a look. And so yeah. we're always watching the surrounding area. We notice the cars that have been parked too long. 
we've noticed the, that she's on her Bluetooth and she's walking and talking and she looks a little nervous. Um, and so you pull up on that type of scenario and situation, it can get you hurt and her hurt. So my best advice is call your local law enforcement, call the National Human Trafficking Hotline, but whatever you do, do not get involved at that moment. Yeah, it's because it's also not safe because like you said, the scout's there, the pimp is there and who knows, you know, they may retaliate in some way. So when you're approaching women on the street, what we know about human trafficking victims is they don't often identify as victims of human trafficking. They just consider themselves to be a prostituted person. So how do you approach them um, so that they understand that they're victims? Well, we don't approach them as victims in terms of human trafficking. We approach them as a resource when they are ready to change their life. Um, because one of the things is that, you know, at that moment you want to empower versus disempower. Yeah. You know, when you treat a person like a victim, um, then it puts them in a place of, you know, you're just another. And we've had people say, you know, there was a church that came out and they made us feel real bad. When you treat yeah. a person like a victim, you actually treat them like victims and you don't treat them as if they have a right to, to come out. And so our approach is, hi, you know, my name is Tara um, with FCI. I just have a bag for you inside of some, some things for you. There's also a card when you're ready, if you need some help, give us a call. God bless you. Can we pray for you? Yes. Or, she'll either say yes or no. If she says no. And we'll say, what is your name? So we can, we don't have to be in front of you to pray for you, but we definitely can pray for you. Um, outside of here and they'll say okay my name is Tasha or Skittles or Bubbles and um, and we and we and we keep our word I think the issue becomes understanding the culture of where you are and how things work um, in every um, in in this world of human trafficking every street has its own culture and language and when you go you begin to you begin to notice it when you're on the streets enough got it so yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's clear there's a lot to this, a lot to this. And we don't want churches to take on street outreach unless they really been trained. I know a lot of churches really feel called by God. You know, we discourage them because we know that just the subtle things you mentioned about treating them as victims needs to be addressed. So, but the ones that insist, you know, they definitely need to meet with an organization like yours and really understand all the different dynamics. And what you just shared was beautiful. I mean, it, I mean, it was really thorough. It was really hit the nail on the head, so to speak, about, like you said, the culture they're in mm -hmm. versus yes. our culture, which is totally different. Which, and I just want to add this one point. We've ha actually had um, uh, girls to tell us that the worst people to ever come to the streets to help them were church ladies. Yeah, because I've they made them too. feel uh, condemned. They made them feel yeah. like pros prostitutes. They made them feel so dirty. You know, they've gone to churches and people, you know, gawk at them, stare at them, and they just feel really bad. And, you know, and, and the other thing is that what we have learned, and we've actually um, not allowed people to go out onto our streets anymore with us um, when they violate certain things. And one of the things that we are adamant about is if she says, no, she doesn't want to talk to you, leave her alone. Do not chase down a car. Do not prevent her from getting into a car. Do not do that. You know, because what happens is that sometimes our zeal can become very, um, it can become very judgmental. It can become dangerous, you know, and we know as a church, sometimes you, you have that righteous indignation um, and I understand that, but at the moment you have to decide, is this righteous di indignation of the Lord? Is this something I'm personally feeling like I need to stop because it's a personal agenda for myself. Yeah. And so when we recognize that in certain volunteers, we, we've not allowed them to go back to the streets because we had a lady one time on the streets with us and she ran after the car oh, no. with the girl and separated from the team. And we train that you never separate from the team, especially the team leader. And she did that. And so we, we had to ask her um, politely tell her that she was unable to come back. Yes, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I really wanna commend you for, you know, really wanting to protect mm -hmm. these, you know, the people who are on the street from being exploited in so many different ways. People may have, like you said, they may have a passion or zeal for it, but mm -hmm. 
but they really need to honor people like you before they take a step forward. Yeah, they really and do. We tell, and we tell them, you know, have the zeal, but use it in wisdom. You know, one of the things that I love about Jesus is even with the woman at the well, he never offended her with his zeal for her to, you know, come into the knowledge that he was the living water. And I think we have to use his example. Nowhere in the Bible do you see the Lord beating people up to come out of what they're in in order for them to be saved, you know? And so we, we, we actually preach and most people don't know that we're a faith-based organization. So I feel so much freedom and liberty today to just talk about the Lord because, you know, our goal is for them to experience Jesus without us ever saying one word. And do you know, they say that there's so much, something different about you guys. Yes. And we never say we are faith-based or anything. We just love on them. Yes. Yes. I call it the mother Teresa method where you love on them and serve them but you don't push Jesus and she converted thousands without offending anyone because, you know, she was in a country where they would have run her out of town if she had been critical yeah. of, you know, what they were doing. So is there anything you'd like to add um, to what we talked about today that you feel is important for our audience to know? I do. I, you know, you and I have talked about changing the narrative. And I think that the only way the narrative is going to change is if you begin to look through a different lens. Um, you know, I grew up in South LA and, and grew up with a, a, a mom that was a drug addict and she was a prostitute. And um, I've had cousins, I've had family members. And, but when I know, now that I know what I know, looking back, all of the people that I mentioned were victims of child sexual abuse or rape or um, the foster care system. And so uh, unfortunately they ended up and a life that was, was, was really bad. And so growing up as a child and seeing that and being around it, now that I do this work, it, it's almost like I can put um, the pieces of the puzzle together and understand, okay, so that, that was not okay. Um, that happened, but I understand now what led certain you know cousins or friends or even my own mother down that particular um, trail. And so understanding that women and I say women because right now we only um, serve women who are victimized. Women that have um, that have been uh, abandoned or hurt um, and have never experienced love will turn to anything that they can get love from, even if it's destructive, even if it's abusive. Someone said today that on social media there's this thing that's trending that's called sugar daddies looking for sugar babies. Yeah. You know, and yeah. so sugar daddies have been around forever and we know a sugar daddy to be a man that is 70 years old with a 14 year old girlfriend okay and so in certain communities that has been okay and we've said you know as long as she's getting paid well that's human trafficking yes you know so calling it what it is and so that's what i mean by changing the narrative a man uh that is 60 something years old does not need to be having sex with a child that is that is against the law Yes. You know, and so, so making, again, holding folks accountable. And so, you know, my goal, personal goal is just to really change the narrative. If it's just educating, if it's raising awareness, if it's um, offering a cup of coffee to a girl and just not asking any questions, opening our doors so that, you know, more women can, you know, find the love and the freedom that they need to come off the streets. Because Susan, if we don't share the love of Christ yes, in word and in deed, Yes. then we're just as guilty as the perpetrators of human trafficking themselves. Yes, that's a great place to complete. I love that, to that message. Yes, it is our job as people of faith to spread the love of Jesus. And I love the example you gave at the well. I mean, that speaks volumes. And throughout the Bible, he never condemned, never never he met people where they were at and loved them and uh, i mean it was just i mean it was awesome so anyway i thank you so much for being here today you are just a wealth of knowledge but more than that tara there's something about where you come from i mean it's just so beautiful the the way you see the whole issue i mean you do i mean you're calling out who needs to be you know reprimanded you know like the sugar daddies whatever you want to call it held to account and but your compassion for everyone 
you know, the churches, the women on the street, whatever, is just such a loud communication. It's just really a privilege to be with you. And I really thank you very much thank for you. the opportunity to be with you. Thank you for having me, Susan. Absolutely.